So we've looked at this map of the world's major language families, and I just said, I'll look at how all these far-flung languages come from a common ancestor. Uh, but it does lead to the question of how anybody knows this. It certainly would not be uh, obvious that many of these very distant languages have any kind of shared history at all. Now, one of the most basic methods that has been used and to identify language families is called the comparative method. Um, so here, let's take a look in the, uh, using the example of the Indo-European language family. And here's an example of some of these giant tables that we see put together. And so just imagine uh, giant uh, poster sized sheets of paper just with columns and columns and what you do in the comparative method is essentially make uh, each row uh, is a word and then each column represents a different language that you think you know, might be related somehow. Of course if you put a language that's not related you'll see that you know, it's not going to, it's not going to match up. It's always going to be an exception. But when you put languages that actually are related together in a table like this, there start to show up some very surprising correspondences. Now, words that have this, uh, the same ancestor that are, you could say are sister words or cousin words, they're called cognates, meaning born, born together. And so these are called cognate sets, trying to uh, establish these sets of words that are, can be said to descend from the same word. So ignore that column on the left there because that's showing the results of the work here. But let's just look at the, you know, imagine just, imagine just starting to put together uh, a table like this where you say, okay, here's the English word mother. And of course, it's showing that it comes from Old English uh, Modor. Okay, so you have Modor and then uh, the Gothic language and East Germanic language, Modar. And then you see Latin Mater and ancient Greek Meter, okay, as in we see an example of the goddess Demeter and in the word metropolis, meaning a mother city. Um, so start to find these, these patterns and as with anything in you know, the world of statistics, you know, when you find a few of them, you can start to think, well, you can think maybe these are simply coincidences. After all, coincidences do happen. Um, and when you find words that appear to be related but are not, they're called false friends. Um, but when you see enough of them, start to think that you know it becomes harder to imagine that it is just a, a random coincidence uh, because the coincidences just start lining up too much. Not only that you see a, a parallel but that the parallels follow a consistent format um, where you know certain sounds in one language are matched with certain sounds in other languages. For example here you see for both mother and father, um, you know, Gothic goes modar fadar, so the, the the sound in English corresponds to the D in Gothic, the T in Latin, and also the T in, in Greek, and as well uh, in Sanskrit as well. And you can continue with these other major languages that are all related in the Indo-European family. And this really, um, you can just imagine the, the excitement that would have happened in the early days of the, these correspondences being developed because it really does seem amazing that these completely, assumed to be completely different languages. You have English, you, know, you have Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit, three of the, the great languages of the ancient world, um, that they all happen to, they, they, they seem to be related. And we can, and so Sanskrit language of ancient India, 
uh, Greek and Latin languages of the ancient Mediterranean, all seeming to share these correspondences. So, yeah, you can see the same pattern continue with even with brother and, uh, and sister as well. So you see for here, for brother, again, you notice the, the, uh, the T again, the the sound in English corresponds to the T. And you also see that, you know, the F, okay, here the F in Latin corresponds to the B in English and Gothic, so the, the two Germanic languages here. You see the P in Greek, the B in Sanskrit. These, you know, if you just see one of them, you wonder, but when you see this repeated over and over, okay, you're going to see like, you know, when you see a B in Sanskrit, it's going to be a F in Latin. You see this repeated over and over, and you can start to imagine the, the sorts of sound changes that might have happened. So you start to reconstruct backwards. And it is surprising how much of these, uh, this whole idea of these, you know, proto-languages and proto-Indo-European being this shared ancestor language, uh, it's entirely reconstructed. There's no direct evidence for it existing as a language, but you, you, you just start with these cognate sets, the, this table of correspondences, and then you imagine, you start to rewind the changes that might have happened and imagine, you know, what would the original or the earlier language have to have been like in order to lead to this particular pattern of daughter languages. And that's where you can cr end up creating this column after a lot of uh, uh, discussion and uh, trying different hypotheses and so on. Um, and the debates on many of the details are still ongoing. But it's proposed that you know if you have an original Proto-Indo-European form something like mehter and this is described as h number two because there's a few different h's that are imagined in pie and uh, the exact details of them are disputed um, so then but this could be like if, if you imagine this as the proto form then you could actually draw out these changes that happen to gradually end up with the words that we see, that we know exist in later languages. For example, the T here, okay, we'll say, well, that T becomes a the, you know, for English, it becomes a D for Gothic, uh, and so on. And you see here for father, it's imagined that the original, the earlier form was a P, so the P became a F in the Germanic languages, English and Gothic, right? And, um, you know, you can see different, right here you see even in, in Russian, the P disappeared entirely in, in Slavic. Um, so you start like, it, it, it really is hard to believe that you can, that you can work all this out um, with just, just looking at a few words. But as you keep adding more words, these, these giant tables just uh, going on and on and on, and more and more words added showing repeated patterns. Uh, you start to really get a picture that becomes possible to test whether, whether it really makes sense. And eventually you get so comprehensive a picture with so many different correspondences and a clear system of, you know, this must have changed to this for, you know, in this earlier language. And that's where you start to get all that, that tree worked out. Okay, the, these were the same language at some point, and then they branched. One language made this change, another language didn't, made another change, and you start to see how this whole tree forms. And you continue to test that against the actual evidence you have, the only real evidence you have, which is the evidence of actual known languages through written records and so on. And from there, you can really reconstruct a very probable picture. As much as we can say we don't really know, there's no direct evidence, but it seems to be a highly probable picture um, of some kind of earlier form of a language that 
would have had many of these features. And so we see this in many different areas. The vocabulary can be taken from all over the language. Here's examples for the pronouns, like you see I is, you know, matched with, you have ik um, in Gothic, this, and you have, and that's with ego in Latin and in Greek as well, uh, from aham in Sanskrit uh, and so on. And they, so really the, the correspondences are really quite surprising um, and they just, they just go on and on. I find one of my favorite examples uh, is the number two, because you can see how, you really see how in so many different languages, uh, the number two has this kind of common form. Uh, and, and even as it's spelled in English, you have tuo, or Old English twa, uh, and you can see then, you know, Latin duo. So if you imagine tuo and duo, you know, when you, when you look at the way the words are pronounced now, you think two and duo. Okay, they're quite different, but, you've, you know, looking down into the, the, the past of each word, imagine this is twa, this is actually pronounced tuo, and this is duo, you know, and then, and then in Sanskrit, it's dva. So you, you can see how these could possibly be related together. And then it's all tracked back to imagining this Proto-Indo-European uh, duo, and also a neuter form, different gender forms uh, as well. So these tables go on and on. Um, and uh, you, you eventually build a picture of what is almost certainly going to be this language family, and that is a picture of the Indo-European language family. Um, and it was really, that's the main method for reconstructing these, these language families, any of them. I can show another example from the, the orange here, the Afroasiatic language family. And here, one of the main um, sub-branches of it is the Semitic language family, uh, best known for including Arabic and Hebrew. So here we see some examples of shared words. For example, we have bait, and, and, bait, uh, and uh, bet, you see all like these, these words that are something like bet, uh, which is traced back to this proto-Semitic word bait. Um, this is even the origin of the letter beta, which is our, our letter B originally was a little picture of a house, a little floor plan of a house, and that comes from this word. That'll be a whole other story, the origin uh, of our, our writing system. And you see, uh, you know, for example, they hear the word salam, uh, Arabic salam, Hebrew shalom, um, and these other, the ancient Akkadian language, you see it as well, uh, Kiez, language of ancient Ethiopia, Mehri, uh, Salom, language of South Arabia, uh, Maltese, later language. So all of them uh, sharing uh, consistent sound patterns that can be traced back to this uh, proto-Semitic word. And then, of course, Semitic being the major branch of Afroasiatic, you can then take Semitic and imagine that as just being one branch here. And now you can combine it with other languages, including uh, ancient Egyptian, uh, which is a appears to be a related language. Although, you know, the further out you get into these uh, bigger families, the, the harder it is to make clear correspondences. But here you see uh, you know, Chadic's language of, uh, of Northern Africa, Cushitic, Omotic, and Berber, more languages of North, North and Northeast Africa. Um, and especially ancient Egyptian and Semitic, which is a uh, fascinating uh, combination. So here you can see regular patterns, uh, some of these quite difficult to pronounce. Um, but, you know, for example, you would see, uh, you know, both uh, here we have Dai, Mut, MWT, well, it's also MWT, um, Release. LSN for tongue. Um, some of these cases, like these changes are 
much bigger. So it requires going much, much deeper to try to figure out the match. And as well, there's also the issue that for many of these words, like there isn't always a matching word uh, because uh, in many cases, uh, you know, the word itself can change. You're not, you know, we can start to use uh, a different word for the same thing. Famous example is the word dog that came into English. It's not really used anywhere else. Um, in other languages, it would have uh, been the word hound, right? So we would have had, in Old English, we had the word hound, and you see hund uh, related to this uh, canis, kunos. Um, and so this word for dog, but in English, we started using the word dog. Okay, so that, that completely replaced the word hund. There's no, there's no genetic relationship. There's no, there's no correspondence between the English word dog and these other words like hund. Um, so that's just a completely different word. So here we see that, you know, that, that's where you see the blanks in this table, that there isn't always a matching word there. But when you put it all together, you eventually get enough uh, links to think that this probably is uh, related. Although you can see here like omotic here, starting to wonder, you know, do you really have enough here? You have one word. Uh, based on this chart, I would not be very convinced about omotic being part of the family. Uh, but you start to see, uh, you know, some languages are easier than others to show the parallel. And even based on this chart, you know, it's not quite as clear and convincing uh, as we saw, you know, in, in, in tables like you see here. Um, but if you just keep adding more of these cognate sets, be building an even clearer picture of the sound correspondences. You can start to get a picture of what of an earlier proto form of the language that could be plausibly and probably expected to have led through regular sound changes, splits along the way as people diverge and languages split to lead to the present languages we know. And that's really the foundation of the evidence for why languages are considered to be part of families.